are you telling me that there are companies in China that make knockoffs yeah. of things? Yeah, yeah. Or sometimes they don't even make them. They just <laughs> register a trademark, which is crazy. And then, you know, you <laughs> you can get the trademark back a lot of times because, you know, you can prove that they, maybe they, they show that, we can show that they registered dozens of trademarks and never actually released any products or something like that. But it costs thousands of dollars to fight it. You need to go back and forth and it takes years to do it. All right, Zachary, you've been practicing law for about a decade at this point, and you've worked with lots of different companies in video games and board games and just creativity in general. Tell me some of the common questions that these game companies, these developers come to you with. What are some like the main issues that you just see, you know, you, you, you see people running into uh, over the years? I, I think one of the most common ones when designers or developers or whoever is the creative to come to me, they ask, you know, do I need to form some sort of company or business entity before I either publish the game or start a Kickstarter or uh, publish whatever creative work that they're doing? And I mean, the answer usually is yes. I think a, a mentor of mine told me a while ago, you'd be basically committing malpractice if you told someone that, no, you shouldn't <laughs> you shouldn't form a separate business entity to, to run your business. The reason is that there's so many sort of entanglements that a business gets into, whether it's signing contracts with people or providing a product that could potentially be a choking hazard uh, or uh, creating some intellectual property that could potentially be infringing on some existing intellectual property. I mean, there's so many ways that you could potentially accrue liability uh, from third parties that having a shield against that liability is almost uh, the, the baseline for going into business. That is to say, I, I mean, it's not a requirement. You can always go into a, a forming a business without actually forming a company and do it as a sole proprietor. I wouldn't recommend it, but there are also other ways to get around it, right? You could get business insurance that is big enough uh, as far as the coverage goes uh, to cover you in case there's any any kind of issue like that, uh, but but the main reason people do it, or the main thing that people do, is to create some sort of LLC or corporation, something like that. It's also a good idea because it's it's like one bucket where all of the game or creative work goes into, right? So if you're doing a YouTube channel, that LLC is going to own all of the content, and that makes it easily transferable. So if you were to sell you you know you wanted to you know get acquired by another company or something like that uh it's easier for them to come in buy the shares and that's it they they now own everything that the company owned so yes the limited liability is a huge part of it but there are also other other uh things that make it easy to run your business the other one would be if you have multiple partners or, or owners um working on that you want to have some company documents that will describe how you make decisions, how you um, divide up the, the profit, et cetera. All of that stuff goes into uh, making it almost a necessity to form some sort of company. Uh, I, I understand. And with all the things we'll talk about, <laughs> I should say this up front, uh, they all cost money. Uh, you know, they all kind of are a barrier to entry for business. And that's why I always will say, you're not required to do any of this stuff. Uh, and you're not required to hire a lawyer, but it's always pretty much a good idea across the board. Well, it's interesting how often people try to do certain things themselves when they have no experience, they have no background, they read an article on Google, and then they go and try to do something. And then they they, they wonder like, oh, wh why did this cost me an absorbent amount of money? It's like, well, that you tried to save money, but then it cost you 10x <laughs> what you tried to save. And so, yeah, I think that's, that's something like if my toilet explodes... I'm probably going to hire a plumber. Like I'm not going to try to figure out how to fix all the pipes underneath my house because I have no idea how to do that. But yet legal wise, I, I, I do this too. Like sometimes I'd be like, ah, I think I could just figure it out when it would probably save me a lot of time and probably a lot of money <laughs> to just go hire a professional. So you say you read it, you, you read one article on Google. I mean, I basically read a lot of articles on Google. <laughs> that's, that's how you learn to be a lawyer, right? I mean, there are books, law books, you take classes, all that stuff, but it's not like some arcane knowledge that no one could pick up, right? I mean, it is, you know, just learning to be a lawyer and learning the specific laws and, and, and all that. 
the issue is, like you say, it's a time versus money question. Do you want to spend all the time learning how to file a trademark and do a trademark clearance and, and understand why you would be or would not be infringing on someone else's trademark? Or do you just want to pay someone to do it for you and handle that and forget about that and concentrate on making your game or, or doing your creative project, which you know, I, I like to do everything myself as well. I'd like to learn how to do it. You know, I made my own website. I do this, I do that. Uh, sometimes it's easier to just pay someone to do it for you. At some point <laughs> you, you transition into more money than time as opposed to more time than money. And it's just worth it to, to let someone else handle these things. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's also a matter of just information. It's if you're going to do it yourself, the question becomes how many holes do you want to fall into? And how many do you want to avoid? Because if you don't have the knowledge, for instance, I hired an accountant years ago. And the first year that this guy did my taxes, I was like, how in the world did you get that much money back? Like I went from paying a lot of money to all of a sudden getting a huge check from the government. And he's like, oh, well, you probably didn't know about this and this tax deduction and this over here. And exactly. you can move money around like this. And I was like, you're a, you're a freaking wizard, dude. And he's like, no, I just know the tax code <laughs> in and out. Right. I was like, and I, wow. Yeah. A lot of times they have access to software and services and things like that, that will help them to do that, that you as a, an individual with one job, don't want to pay for. But for instance, I have trademark clearance software and trademark docketing software that will keep track of all these deadlines and all that stuff that, you know, I pay a lot for, but you don't need to pay for, but you pay me to have access to, right? It's the same with, with a lot of these professionals, uh, the knowledge, the tools, all of that stuff just makes things better for you. Much smoother, I think. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, let's go back and talk just for a second. Would you suggest someone start Again, if they're in the United States, it might be different in Europe. But would you suggest they start an LLC, a limited liability company, or an S corp or corporation? Like, what do you think someone should do if they're just starting out? Interesting thing. Uh, you mentioned S corp versus LLC. S corp is what's called a tax election. It's only specifically how the underlying company is taxed. So you can have an LLC as the structure of your company, just like you can have a partnership or a sole proprietorship or a corporation. But the way that it's taxed, an LLC is taxed as a, as a partnership uh, by default, but you can have it taxed as an S corp. You can have it taxed as a C corp uh, in the U.S. at least, which dictates how, whether the entity itself pays taxes, how the taxes or the income and, and, and liabilities pass through the entity onto your personal taxes. All of these things are sort of dictated by how you choose to be taxed. So what do I generally recommend? Uh, as far as how you're taxed, I recommend you have some sort of tax advisor. Like you said, you, you, you found a CPA to help you with that. And because everyone's situation is going to be different, I'm not an expert on taxes. So I would recommend that you you find someone who is to, to tell you. And it's a simple election. You file one form with the, with the IRS and send it in uh, and, and you can change how you're being taxed. Uh, as far as the underlying company, generally there's a uh, there's there's two situations. One is if you're just going to kind of run the company yourself, you're not getting outside investment. Uh, you're essentially just running a business where you put out a product, you get paid for a product, you pay yourself those profits, right? That's usually an LLC and that's sufficient for, for that purpose. It's a flexible structure to work with. You can kind of dictate how you want things to be run as opposed to a corporation, which is a little more rigid and structured and requires things like annual meetings. Uh, and that's more uh, geared toward if, if you were going to get outside investment. And this is usually more on the video game side than the board game side, because you're not seeing a lot of that, on at least on the hobby board game side of things. So, you know, for most board game or small creatives, like if you run a YouTube channel or something like that, an LLC is probably fine. I mean, you'll see lots of big companies, Sony, uh, Sony's... Uh, you know, PlayStation company here in the U.S. is is an LLC, right? I mean, it's it's just a limited liability company, and you can kind of dictate how it runs internally with your operating agreement. So, no problems there. Gotcha. Now, another thing you mentioned was like if you have a partnership, making sure you've got some contracts in place between the partners to figure stuff out. Because I've seen quite a few people, unfortunately, that ran into a situation where one person was done and they want to get out, and it's like, well. Well, how do we do that? Do I do I buy you? Like they didn't have any stipulations. I had no agreements. And another thing I'm thinking about is, I think it was a big time real estate guy was talking about this one time. He said, "Yeah, I don't call them agreements. I call them disagreements because the only time we look at them <laughs> is when we disagree about something." And I was like, "That's, That's a good right. way to look at it." But yeah. as far as you know, partnerships, what are some of the common things you just make? You want to make sure you have the common language, the common 
pieces in there. That way, if someone does want to leave, or let's say someone, uh, you know, does something terrible and they, you know, go to prison, they're like, you know, there's all sorts of scenarios that can play out that you want to kind of make sure you're protected, you know, protecting yourself. What are, what are some of those things? What, what are the things I need to make sure I have as far as partnerships? Right. Inside your operating agreement or your partnership agreement or whatever sort of uh, company agreements you have, you're going to want to have things about a uh, process for transferring ownership, you know, whether you, uh, someone wants to sell their ownership to some third party, right? You don't necessarily want one of your partners to sell their half of the company to someone that you don't like, right? So you want to have a right of first refusal to buy that back first. Maybe you want to have something like a morals clause where you say, if they do something that brings harm, you know, reputational harm to the company, or they're, you know, they commit a felony or something like that, um, you are able maybe to buy back their interest. Uh, one big thing that we do with almost every LLC is when you're first starting a business, everyone's happy, everyone's excited to, you know, and they're in it for the long haul. But maybe three months later, one of the partners gets a full time job and they just don't have time to work on it anymore. Well, now you've given them half your company and they're not going to be working on anything anymore. And you can't really go back. I mean, you could offer to buy it back, but they don't necessarily have to sell it to you. And so what we do is use what's called vesting, where uh, you have the ability to buy back their ownership if they leave after a certain amount of time, or their ownership will only sort of accrue in in chunks over time so that you can um, ensure that they're going to stay on, you know, for three years or four years or however long you sort of expect your initial project or your first chunk of um, work to go until they've really earned the full ownership and, and not being able to pull it back. Uh, and so those vesting agreements are super important. They're really common for startups, but a lot of companies, smaller companies that come to me don't have that. They are just granting everyone the ownership and that runs into issues if someone just stops working or, or is not interested in the company anymore. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Another thing I've had several people ask me about that I wasn't entirely Sure, is non-disclosure agreements, NDAs. When do you need one? When should you sign one? When should you not sign one? What are your thoughts? You know, the blanket answer would be you should probably always sign them because if you have something secret that you're sharing with someone else, you want to have some protection or at least some, you know, a contract is only as good as the paper it's printed on, right? So, I mean, you can have a contract that says you owe me a million dollars if you disclose this uh, to someone else. But if they don't have a million dollars, then there's no way you're going to get that from them. And if they have an LLC with no money in it or something like that, there's no way you're going to get that money. So, I mean, it does serve as a deterrent and it is helpful in that way. But, uh, you know, just be aware of the circumstances and not just what the agreement says. Right. So be selective about who you share your confidential information with uh, and, and only share as much as you need to, to share. But, you know, it's generally a good idea when you're doing entering into any sort of negotiation to get into a bigger agreement with another business or with a maybe you have a contractor that you want to hire to do some art for your game and you're going to share with them all the, you know, the secrets about the game. Get an NDA in place. That's good. A couple situations where people always want NDAs, but they're not really practical would be maybe with uh, you're sending copies of your game or, or product out to be play tested, right? Uh, you know, you, you can ask them for an NDA signature, but a lot of times it's kind of, it's asking a lot, right? I mean, you're often asking them to do it for free. <laughs> and so, you know, you're saying, hey, I want you to play this game for free and give me feedback for free and also take on this potential legal liability if you talk about my game. Um, especially for a lot of small games, you don't necessarily want people to not talk about it, right? You you kind of want them <laughs> to be talking about your game and, and generating some excitement. So I, it doesn't actually always work uh, in your favor. And another one would be if you're sort of approaching publishers to potentially publish your game, a publisher is not going to sign an NDA with you. They don't know who you are uh, unless you really have a reputation and are someone that they, they know they want to sign that NDA with. They don't want to take on liability in case maybe they have their own game that's very similar to yours or something like that. I mean, they, they are not going to agree to that. So don't even bother. It's going to make you look unprofessional, I think, if you try to approach a publisher with an NDA, um, if you don't have already kind of accrued a reputation and, and, and that professionalism already, unfortunately. Yeah, I completely agree. 
on that. One of the main places I've seen them, especially in the hobby game space, they're not as not as prevalent, I think, in the hobby board game space as video games in other places. Uh, unless you're talking about licensed games, if you're working with Marvel, DC, Disney, something like that, that's the main place or main time that I've seen those come into play. And are, in those situations, is that really coming from Marvel? Is that the main person that's kind of making sure that's an NDA or is it the company that's doing the game or something like that? Yeah, most likely the licensor who is Marvel or whoever owns the the, the IP that's the, the subject of the license. They're the one that's going to dictate anyone that you talk to about this game is going to have an NDA in place only because they they don't want the terms of their agreement to come out. They don't want the fact that you're making the product to come out a lot of times and they don't want any of their kind of confidential information. Maybe they have, you know, maybe you're doing a game based on a movie that's not coming out for three years or something like that. And it's going to be very important for them that you don't disclose this to anyone who's not under NDA already and that potentially they could go after if they did disclose this. So yeah, super big deal with, with us. The bigger the company, the more, <laughs> the more strict they're going to be about, about these kinds of things for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. All right. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about copyright and trademark. That's another thing that I've had so many people ask me about or just ask in the community online that I run. And I feel like there's a lot of misconceptions about copyright and trademarks and they get people, you know, people get those things confused and they miss, they think one is the other and whatever. So first of all, what exactly is a trademark versus a copyright? And then what are the, some of the main things that people just to, they just need to be aware of? Copyright uh, is the exclusive right to essentially to make copies of your original creative works. So to make copies, to distribute, to publicly perform, to create derivative works from. So if you make one game to be able to make any kind of sequel or, or um, you know, derivatives of that work, that's your exclusive right as the copyright owner. And that you know, others are not allowed to do that with your work. And it has to be an original creative work. Uh, it can't be anything that's functional or factual within the work. It can't be anything that's sort of like an underlying game mechanic uh, it needs to be like an actual creative thing, like text, the text of your rules or the or the graphic design and the artwork of the game or uh, things like that. Things that are creative in nature and not necessarily. Now, obviously, game designers would probably say that there's a lot of creativity in the game design itself. Uh, but unfortunately, the law doesn't see it that way. And um, you can visit my blog. I have blog posts about this. Uh, some of the cases about this, uh, what is sort of protected by copyright in a game. And unfortunately, the design and the mechanics and, you know, characters' powers and things like that are not going to be protected by copyright. So next is trademark. And trademark protects something totally different. Trademark actually protects consumers from being confused about the source of the goods that they buy. So imagine you walk into a store and you see a bottle that says Coca-Cola on the label, right? But it's made by some guy down the street in his bathtub, but he's just slapping the label of Coca-Cola on it. Uh, you don't know where that, <laughs> you don't know if there wasn't trademark law and if they weren't allowed to stop other people from doing that and give those exclusive rights to a trademark owner, you wouldn't know where your products are coming from. So that's what they try to accomplish uh, with trademark law. And it's going to protect your your brand names, like your game name or your company name, and then your logos, your uh, uh, maybe the trade dress. You know, one famous one is uh, the the shape of a Coke bottle is very distinctive and they can protect that because that's uh, that's that gains so much um, distinctiveness with consumers that the law wants to protect that. So again, so you can't walk into a store and see the same exact bottle shape and think that it's made by Coke. And then there's patents. Patents protect uh, innovations and inventions and improvements to other inventions, things that are not obvious to other practitioners in the field. Um, and those are Maybe less common in board games and video games, but they're still there. I mean, there's still lots of them uh, for sure. I don't know. Uh, and then there's something called trade secrets, which is the fourth type of intellectual property. And that's basically any kind of secret that you have that has some value in uh, in the industry that you're in. Uh, a big one, again, going back to Coke, is would be the formula for Coke, the recipe for Coke, right? That's something that a recipe, because it's just functional, it's a list of items, uh, is not copyrightable, but it is something that you would have to keep secret. And, you know, the catch 22 of protecting intellectual property is that you have to register it in order to protect it. So if you have something secret, you can't register it. So you basically have to just 
keep it keep it inside, only share it with people that are under NDAs and all of that. And that's maybe one of the reasons why uh, everyone wants NDAs, especially from the big companies, because these are not copyrightable things. Maybe they're ideas or plans or something like that, but they want to keep them secret. Gotcha. First of all, yeah. knockoff Coke made in a bathtub, I think is the mm-hmm. origin story of Pepsi. <laughs> but... I have no doubt. At least Dr. Pepper. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, so let's talk about copyrights just for a second. Mm-hmm. How, how do I, do I have to file a copyright or as soon as I put it out into the world, is it automatically legally binding copyrighted? Like, how does that work from a legal standpoint? From, from the standpoint, from a legal standpoint, as soon as you, they call it fixation. As soon as you fix something in a tangible medium of expression, you have copyright rights. That means when you write something down, when you save a f- digital file on your computer, when you record a video or take a photo of something copyrightable, you have rights, underlying copyrights in that thing. The issue is, at least in the US, you can't actually do anything with those rights. You can't file a lawsuit against someone unless you've registered that copyright. So, and it used to be that you just had to have filed for the registration because when you file it, it can take three months, it can take a year to get the actual registration, depending on how quickly the copyright office is moving. Supreme Court a few years ago ruled that it needs to actually have been registered before you can sue someone. So what's happened sometimes is I will have a client and we want to send a demand letter to someone that says, hey, you're infringing on my copyright. Uh, You need to stop. And they'll come back and say, well, where's your registration? Because they basically know that we can't do anything without that registration. Now, fortunately, they do offer you an option uh, graciously allowing you to pay eight hundred dollars extra <laughs> to to get a an expedited copyright uh, registration, which actually takes about a day, which is great, but it's an additional cost that you don't want to have to pay if you had just filed it the day that you uh, created the thing, right? You publish your board game and you file a copyright registration that day, which is the, the probably the best time to do it. Uh, and then, as far as trademark goes at least in the US, when you use a trademark in commerce, which is to say you actually sell a game with the name that you want to trademark, you have trademark rights and you have something called common law trademark rights, which is, you know, uh, unregistered, but you do have the ability to protect that. It's not as good as the uh, registered trademark, which allows you to sue someone for trademark infringement in federal court. But really, the wh- what I find to be the most uh, useful benefit of a trademark registration isn't the protection you get later on, but it's the protection you can get from the beginning. So with games specifically, most of the time a developer or designer will come up with a game name, let's say today, but they're not actually going to get that game into consumers' hands for another couple years, right? So in the time between today when you've decided on the name and the time when your common law trademark rights accrue, that's a couple years that other people could have been coming up with the same name and actually releasing products. So you're not going to have those exclusive rights and that other party is going to have the rights to that name. So you may have wasted months or years advertising a game under a certain name and then you have to change it at the end, right? Because you haven't filed any kind of trademark registration. Now, if you filed a trademark application today, you could file it as what's called an intent to use application that then gives you rights dated as of the day you file it, even though you don't actually use it until later on, which is, I think, the most important part of trademark registration and the reason to do it for especially board game and video game uh, developers, because uh, you don't want to waste that time marketing your game when you don't even really have the, uh, the rights in that name. That makes sense. Sometimes yeah, it really can get point. confusing, the intent to use and all the all the dates and all the craziness. But, you know, trust me when I say it has happened more than a few times with clients of mine where we're lucky that we have filed that trademark application. And, you know, sometimes it can be we send a demand letter and say, hey, we filed this application. You can't use this name. You know, maybe they run a Kickstarter and then we can contact Kickstarter potentially. I mean, the technicality of it is that even though you do have those rights going back to that day until you've actually finally and fully registered your trademark, you don't actually have those rights. So you kind of need to register it first and then come back and say anyone that that used it in that period of time is infringing. But we can certainly send a letter to warn them and say, hey, this is going to happen if you don't stop using this. And a lot of times they will they will stop. Nobody wants a letter from a lawyer. 
uh, unfortunately, I'm a nice guy, but you know, nobody wants to hear from me, unfortunately, which is good for you if, if you're the client, but uh, you know, bad for me and maybe personal relationships or whatever. But yeah, it's uh, it's definitely useful. Uh, and it it has happened. I can tell you from real world experience, we've had to do that and had to stop other people. And sometimes you can even sell the trademark to someone else, right? If they, you know, you've, you've spent a thousand dollars getting this trademark but maybe a big brand comes in and starts using it, you know, you may be able to sell that for a lot more, you know, maybe it's 50,000, right. That you sell it for, which is, uh, you know, a good deal if you're a small, small game designer. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I've also seen and going back to the, like the whole idea of, of preemptive thinking ahead, like really thinking about what you're going to do long-term. I can't remember what company it was. This is a video game company. A few years ago, they were so excited about this game they were working on and they put out a trailer and then, but they hadn't, gotten the domain the url for like the website <laughs> yeah. and so some random dude on the internet saw the trailer was like oh okay and he went on godaddy or wherever and was like oh this yeah. url is for, for sale and he he registered it and then sold it to the company <laughs> sure. later and so you know <laughs> that that does happen in fact it's something i'm sort of dealing with right now um it does happen a lot and you know, we there are companies that are out there that are just watching new trademark registrations and, and seeing if they can get the domain names. Uh, there are procedures in place to help deal with that. If someone registers a domain in bad faith, uh, then you could potentially do what's called a UDRP proceeding to get ICANN, which is the, the domain name authority. You can get them to basically give you the domain name back uh, if it's been done in bad faith and you can prove that you have a registration. Uh, it's a little tougher, though, if you only have an application and you haven't actually started using it before that person registered the domain. So, yes, the lesson is get your domain names uh, <laughs> registered along with your trademark registration once you decide on your name, for sure. Now, I've seen a lot of board game publishers. I think it's a little different video games because the, the ceiling for the amount of money you can make is so much different in the video game space. Board game space, margins are kind of low. It's hard to make a lot of money. You, you're probably only selling a couple thousand copies you know, if you're an indie publisher. So with that being the case, is it is it always worth it to go through all these processes and spend all the money that it, it goes into to file all the trademarks on or are you really just putting yourself more in the hole, especially if you're just, you know, registering a game title or something like that? I'm nodding my head, but the answer is no. It's not always worth it. And a lot of times what people will do is wait until they see that something is a hit, put it up on Kickstarter. If it starts to get some attention, then you file the trademark for it. And, you know, the things I talked about are risks, you know, other people using your name or, or what have you. They're risks, but they're probably low risks. So if you're okay with sort of accepting that business risk and maybe you have some flexibility, you can change the name or, or sort of deal with whatever problems come up, then I totally understand not wanting to pay $1,000 to register a trademark. And I will tell any client this, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not like, you must do this. I mean, I think it's a good thing to do. And I think it's very helpful for the reasons I talked about, but I totally understand that it is not, uh, cost effective unless until until it becomes a problem right and then you will have wished that you did it but you know if you're okay and you're flexible enough that you're you're okay changing the name you know there have been uh things where you know someone's put a, a game up on kickstarter and then they've gotten a trademark takedown and, and they've had to take down the whole campaign and kind of messes with the campaign had they done a clearance search and maybe filed a trademark application beforehand they could have avoided that uh, they could have come back to Kickstarter and said, hey, actually, I have a registration for this or or what have you. Um, eh, you know, it's, it's all risk. It's all risk assessment and, you know, uh, seeing what you can accept. And that's fine. That's a lot of business, right? Uh, it's just the name of the game. Am I remembering correctly that a trademark only works for the country that you file it in? So if I file a trademark in the U.S., then, you know, a company in Canada they don't care. They can do whatever they want. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. They're territorial. Uh, so, and again, you want to talk about costs. Yes, you can file in the U.S. and then you can take that U.S. application and file it in the EU and Australia and Japan and uh, you know, all over the world. Uh, but the costs get kind of astronomical. If you wanted to do every country in the world, you're going to pay tens of thousands of dollars, right? So most likely it's not worth it. So what you want to do is figure out your uh, your biggest markets potentially, and then maybe file in those. But again, it's a cost benefit analysis. I mean, uh, the, the problem is 
outside of the US, it's generally a first to file jurisdiction. So what we'll have a lot of times is a game gets popular in the US and then in China or in the EU, someone else is going to file an application for that because they're getting in before you and they then take those rights and maybe they want to you know, extract money from you or they want to, you know, do their own product with the, you know, that's a knockoff of yours or something like that. But that can be a, a real problem. So again, I mean, I hate to say it, but I mean, it costs money to protect all this stuff. And, you know, you're going to pay 600 US dollars to just get into that international system. And then each country then has their own fees after that. So, I mean, it gets real pricey. You're going to pay thousands of dollars to get in the EU and in Canada and in the US and everywhere. But, you know, if it becomes a problem, you're going to wish you had done it. It's the unfortunate sort of reality about this stuff. You know, protecting yourself legally costs money, unfortunately. Right. Are you telling me that there are companies in China that make knockoffs yeah. of things? Yeah. Yeah. Or sometimes they don't even make them. They just <laughs> register a trademark, which is crazy. And then, you know, you <laughs> you can get the trademark back a lot of times because, you know, you can prove that they maybe they, they show that you can show that they registered dozens of trademarks and never actually release any products or something like that. But it costs thousands of dollars to fight it. You need to go back and forth and it takes years to do it. And it's just a huge pain. So, you know. If you can get it in there beforehand, that would be uh, way, way better. <laughs> but again, it costs it's going to cost you another 600 bucks or so to file a trademark in China, unfortunately. That's what you have to sell, another 1,000 games or 500 or 100 games to, to make up that money, you know, unfortunately. All right, so let's keep traveling down this road of just being aware of, of things that are going to cost money, but also some things that are, are maybe waste of money and things to be aware of, because anytime you're dealing... What I found, anytime you're dealing with legal things, there's always somebody out there trying to hustle you. There's always someone being like, oh, you need to sure. pay me this to do that and the other when you could have probably done it for free easily, right? I'm reminded of my roommate back in college and I was chatting with him one day and he was at his computer working on something and he pulled out his debit card and I was like, oh, are you, are you buying something? He goes, yeah, I'm filing for FAFSA. And I was like, Dude, fast, you don't have to pay for that. Like, what do you, why do you need your debit card? And he was on FAFSA.com, not FAFSA.gov. <laughs> and so yeah. there was this company that was basically charging like 25 or 50 bucks or something like that. And they would file it for you, even though you could go on the government website and do it for free. It's the exact same process. And so are there any things like that that come to mind that people end up getting hustled and end up getting kind of scammed out of their money as far as legal stuff? One of the big ones is since, since all the trademark filings are public, right? There are companies that, you know, uh, scrape all that information from the trademark database. And as soon as you file something new, they will send you these official looking letters that say, hey, you need to register for the global trademark database or something crazy like that. And it's just some made up thing. I don't even know if it even exists, but they want to charge you $800 to do it. Um, and I always tell clients, it's in all of my form emails that I send when I, you know, when we file them, that there are going to be scams and they're going to send them to you. And you should, at the very least, send me a photo of it. Uh, you know, all, all sort of notifications about payments and things like that will go through me as your lawyer. But if you're doing it yourself, you're going to have no idea that these things are fake. You don't know what fees you need to pay and what you don't need to pay and all that. I'm, it's just crazy. Yeah. And, and they look official. Um, you know, sometimes they talk about like, you need to uh, register, you know, I, I don't know. It's all these like fake registries and, and, and things like that. Same with when you form a company, you'll start getting all these kind of scam emails because your business address is online. And there are companies that just, you know, they scrape all this information and, and just send these letters out and they must get, I mean, they must get enough people paying them that, that it makes it worthwhile. It's sad. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like all the emails that we get nowadays, right? And sure, right. I but they, like they, don't, somebody... they don't look ridiculous. They're not for Viagra pills right. or whatever. You know, they are for like things that look official, unfortunately. Yeah, and that's that's the rub, man. It's like it really, because I've gotten some of these things. I registered a trademark a while back. And all of a sudden, yeah, I started getting all these emails, all these things in the mail. And I had to like really look at it and be like, what is this thing? Because it sounds official and they're using all the right jargon and all the right words. And it's like, I... And a lot of times I'll just look it up. I'll just go to Google and be like, okay, what is this thing? It's like, oh, okay, that's a scam. Cool. Good to know. Anytime but, you receive something, <laughs> write, write the name of it and then scam in Google and, and it will tell you, <laughs> is this a scam or not? For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Any other yeah. things that come to mind as far as hustles, 
It's getting us wasted money. That's a good question. I don't know. In my business, not really. I mean, you'll have, I mean, there's, there's Kickstarter scammers and people like that that are maybe they're selling some sort of marketing services or something like that. I have clients that come back to me and say, hey, I paid this guy thousands of dollars to do a bunch of social media videos for me and, and get me followers and all that. And, you know, nothing comes of it. And, you know, unfortunately, what I can tell them is, look, you're going to either pay me more than you paid them and more than you're ever going to get back from them uh, to, to you know, send them a letter or something like that. I mean, it doesn't make sense to try to go after them if, if it's just a couple thousand dollars. But I mean, they, that's how they get you. They, they get you for just enough where you pay them and, you know, they make money and don't need to deliver. And it's really not worth going after them either. Uh, so they can get away with this stuff and it sucks. You know, there's lots of scammers. So you want to make sure that any of these services you're working with have a good reputation. Uh, another thing is like, uh, you know, and I have nothing against uh, developers in other countries, but one thing that I often deal with is a client in the U.S. will hire a company in another country that's cheaper uh, to develop a game or to develop some software, and uh, they will start paying them. A lot of times they will pay them despite not approving the milestones that they're supposed to be approving. Uh, you know, they're supposed to be getting these deliverables and they're saying, well, OK, I'll pay you because they're asking for more money, but they're not actually getting what they promised. And so they'll pay them a bunch. And then at some point they'll realize that they're not getting what they wanted and maybe they have no backup of all the code. And they basically just sent their money into a black hole for months. And, you know, it sucks. But and then there's really no way to get after go after a lot of these companies just because the cost of going to another country and filing lawsuits and go after the company and maybe they don't even have the money to get out of them in the first place. You know, it's just more than than it costs more than you would get back, and it doesn't make sense. And they, you know, they're all whether it was a scam intentionally or it was just a company that went under. Uh, if you're not getting copies of everything you're doing, I mean, even if you hire an individual contractor to do artwork for you, you want to make sure that you're getting backups of all their you know Photoshop files or whatever you know that the sort of underlying materials. You want the rough sketches. You want all that. You want everything you're paying for on a regular basis. Uh, before you pay them, <laughs> right? Because you don't want them to disappear. Uh, even within your country, they can disappear. And again, it may not be worth going after them just because it costs so much to file a lawsuit. It's crazy. Yeah. So just be yeah. smart when you're point. working with people. Right. And it's unfortunate. It, it happens. You know, I've worked with artists that have disappeared. And, and luckily, I hadn't paid them everything. And it, it, you just have to write it off. Be like, well, I got to go find somebody else. And that's just over in the loss column. But um. Let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about the other side of it. Let's say I'm working on a project and I receive a cease and desist letter, right? Where someone is saying that I am, copy, you know, I'm infringing on their trademarks or their copyright or something like that. What do I do in that situation? Call me and then we can talk about it. I think that would be the first. Well, don't call me. Email me. I don't, I don't like taking calls. Uh, <laughs> this is why I work on the internet. The yeah. I mean, the first step is to read the letter, see what they're claiming to have rights to, and then see if there's an actual case there. A lot of times there isn't. You have to understand what a cease and desist letter is, right? It's basically the cheapest possible way they can get you to stop doing something that they don't like. So even if they don't really have the rights or it's kind of vague, you know, I do it myself. You know, I'm guilty of it too. We'll send a letter that says, hey, you need to stop doing this. And, you know, it costs them a few hundred bucks to do that. Whereas it would cost them, you know, $10,000 to file a complaint in court, right? And to really sue you. And so this is them getting away with it cheaply, right? And so in that, in that case, it's kind of low, low risk, high reward for them. Because if they, if, if they scare you with a letter that looks scary, sounds scary, says they're going to sue you and all this stuff, then, you know, that's a win for them. So a lot of times, you know, the claims are nonsense. I mean, you know, a lot of times they're, they're right on, <laughs> right on point because a lot of times people do sort of overestimate the amount of money or the amount of intellectual property they can take from someone else or what a parody is or, or, you know, all these things that, that people think are fine and they're not actually fine. So that's sort of where that first analysis comes in. And then once we do that analysis, we can push back. A lot of times once you push back, they'll just go away, right? Because they, they weren't expecting any pushback from a small game developer or designer. Um, but when you push back and they see that you've hired a lawyer and, and that it's serious, you know, they may think twice about actually suing you. But 
you never know. I mean, you know, they may, they may sue you. And in that case, you sort of have to deal with it. So again, it's always risk. Uh, you know, is the risk of potentially being sued greater than the detriment to you for just, you know, stopping using, you know, complying with whatever they're asking you to do. And if so, then maybe it's best to avoid the problem altogether. On that note, though, I would say there are certain companies that mm-hmm. you want to make sure you avoid any kind of <laughs> borrowing yeah. of anything. Nintendo seems to sure. like they don't they care. The big one. Like they'll shut yep. down somebody with three followers, three YouTube yep. subscribers. They don't care. They will like come in and, <laughs> yeah. and strike your channel. So yeah. <laughs> any other companies you've seen like that just come down with the hammer and like will spend. Yeah, the funny one in. is. Well, there's there's two. Uh, it's in the trademark context. If you ever put the word monster in your trademark, or you ever put the word Apple in your trademark, they will, uh, even if the examiner allows it through and says that it's okay, uh, you will most likely get them either filing an opposition or contacting you that you need to, uh, you know, get rid of your registration, uh, or else they're gonna they're gonna oppose your trademark. And they have enough money to do it, right? <laughs> and so you can negotiate with them and try to get them to maybe you can change your trademark application or do something to it. Um, but yeah, Monster is notorious for filing oppositions against anything. Uh, even though they don't, I know to my knowledge they don't make games, but they may have toys and things like that, and they, they are really kind of litigious about their their trademarks. So definitely uh, something to watch out for. Uh, yeah, and Nintendo is the other one, big one. I mean, they, especially for fan games and things like that, they are notorious for taking that stuff down, even though, you know, from a practical perspective, it probably doesn't really hurt them at all, but they are notorious for controlling their IP. I mean, they, they shut down like a Pokemon theme party one time at uh, E3 or GDC or something like that. And people were just having fun. And, you know, <laughs> I don't know if they sent the police or whatever, but they uh, they definitely sent a cease and desist letter to get this uh, party shut down. So I don't know. Yeah, they're notorious for that stuff. That's funny. Wow. Just, people just trying to enjoy your your IP. Like they, they're you just would fans. think you'd be like, happy just, about like, that, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a positive thing. Good, good, good PR for your brand. But no, you, you counter it with bad PR, which is, I think is crazy. Well, there's uh, wow. famously uh, what Wizards of the Coast just what did they send a SWAT team or something to, to to someone for having an early copy of some Magic cards? Uh, this I think just happened in the last week. Crazy stuff. Oh man, that is kind of crazy. It also it makes me. Th- have to pause and really think through i've got this farm project that i was going to call it you know the monster apple farm but maybe i just need to uh, rethink the name <laughs> well if it's a farm you may get away from it although monster <laughs> has uh food and beverage related uh, trademarks so they probably would come after you apple maybe not so much all right give me some like horror stories tell me about some projects some companies you've worked on or, or just seen or know about that you're like wow that's that's next level because i feel like you know, it's one thing to sit here. We kind of talk through little things and Nintendo and ha ha ha. You know, but like, give me some real life on the ground stuff that people ran into that they probably could have avoided had they not done things themselves or had they hired a lawyer. Tell me about it. All the worst stories are clients that come to me with a publishing agreement that they signed that has basically no responsibilities on the publisher side and then no way out of it, right? So essentially what you're doing is signing over your game to them and saying, you know, please publish this game and, you know, do a good job, I hope, <laughs> right? There's no no way to keep them on, on track, uh, no minimum amount of marketing spend or marketing activities, no minimum amount of money you're getting for it or anything like that. I mean, it, and it will go on in perpetuity and... You know, they don't necessarily even need to run the Kickstarter or necessarily even sell the game. So you and a lot of times these these contracts maybe don't even give you any money, any minimum guarantee of money or anything like that. So you're essentially taking your game, giving to these people and it goes into a black hole and and never sees the light of day. That's really unfortunate. And that happens way too much. I mean, there are, you know, some companies that are or were notorious for this kind of thing. Um, but then you have others that sort of just act in bad faith or we'll, we'll go to them and say, hey, you know, you want this game forever, but you're not actually promising that you'll keep it available or anything like that. So we added all these things to your termination clause to make sure we can get out. And they will act appalled, like, how dare you? How dare you uh, say that? You know, uh, why wouldn't we you know, publish this game and all that. Well, I've seen it before <laughs> and that's why we're adding it because this is something that happens all the time, unfortunately, you know? And yeah, the, the, the saddest ones are when, when clients come to me and they have a publishing agreement that's just awful for them and there really is no way out of it, right? The best we can do is kind of, you know, hope 
for the best and reach out to the other party and say, look, you're not even selling this thing. Why do you want this anymore? Please give it back. Maybe we can do a buyout or pay some portion of revenue or something like that, some way to get it back. But yeah, it's a sad story. And could it be avoided? Yes, by coming to me in the beginning and having me review the agreements. Uh, I'm working on one where the contract was one page long and is basically extremely vague about everything. And it's just caused nothing but problems, right? Trying to interpret what this sentence meant when two sentences probably could have explained it completely. But just to keep it on one page, they they didn't include all these terms. And yeah, it sucks. You got to, you got to, there's, I have a list of things, basically a checklist of things that we need to address in all these publishing agreements. And if it's not there, then we need to add it. And uh, you know, a lot of these bad agreements don't even talk about this stuff and it becomes vague. And you can, again, this always goes back to the, the issue of, you know, suing someone or taking any kind of legal action costs more money, more and more and more, right? If you want to actually have a lawsuit against someone, it's going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars in the US. And if you could avoid that in the first place by having a good contract and spending, you know, an hour or two of billable time with a, with an attorney in the beginning. Uh, I think that's a good a good win. But I'm the lawyer, so <laughs> of course I would say that. But yeah, I, I, I definitely think sure. it, it can help. Well, you bring up a good point though, because I've seen so many designers, especially brand new designers, that this is their first game that they've ever gotten signed, and they're so excited, they're so happy, and they they're just willing to sign whatever. And they don't even necessarily read it. Like they, you know, they'll read through it, but they don't understand it. And so many contracts are written almost purposefully vague, almost purposefully hard to understand, and using phrases and words and sentence structure that's odd. And so it, it just makes sense to have somebody that can read it, can understand it, and go, "Oh, actually, this is what this means." Oh, you thought it was the opposite of that? No, no, no. This is what it means. And I know it's written like Yoda talking, but it's, you know, it's almost like a puzzle. You have to figure out the riddle, and so just. You know, finding someone who understands, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense because so many people, they do get in a situation where they're kind of trapped. They're kind of stuck. You know, I was in a contract um, that I didn't fully understand at one point. And, you know, luckily I was with working with someone that, you know, it was great. And they, you know, they were like, oh, and once they realized that there was some confusion and misunderstanding, like we kind of worked through it and figured some things out. But had they not done that, had they not been a really great person to work with, they didn't have to fix that. Like I signed something I didn't fully comprehend because I was super new into the whole, you know, uh, publishing space and getting a game signed. And so, you know, I can't imagine how many people run into a scenario where now they're stuck, now they're trapped. And now, now what do you do? For a lot of designers, if it's your first time, sometimes you don't really care about this being the big, fair contract that's going to, you know, last you forever and all that. Sometimes you really just want to get your name out there, which I think is OK. And that's that's fine. You know, a lot of times you don't really want to go back and forth too much and spend a lot of money with the publisher. You just want them to publish the game and sort of get the bare minimum of protection for yourself. And I totally understand that, you know, if it's not your one and only game that you're ever going to publish, hopefully uh, then, then maybe it's okay to sort of take a worse deal in the beginning just to sort of get your name out there and all that. And, and I do have clients that are sort of, you know, this is not their dream game that they're making. This is something that they, you know, designed and they, they found someone to publish and they just want to get a name out there for, for something. And that's totally fine. Totally respectable. But just be aware of <laughs> the issues with these contracts. And a lot of times, you know, when I draft them for the publishers, I draft them for the publisher, right? I don't draft them because I want the developer or the designer to, you know, be it for it to be totally fair to them. You know, I obviously are draft, you know, representing my client and trying to get things better for them. So there's always going to be things to push back on for sure. Negotiate, I think is negotiation is something I feel like a lot of new people, they just feel like they can't, they feel like they're like, I don't know. I don't want to say something. And then they call off the whole deal. And it's like, I know we're in the, the, the business of fun and games, but it's, yeah. it's business. It's still, still business. business. Yeah. 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 And it, especially as the money increases and, you know, people change and things. What happen. I, what I always tell people is, look, they want to publish your game. So you, you have value, right? You are not just like begging them to publish for you, right? You, you, they want to work with you so you can push back on things. Now you may push too far. And that's something that I'm always aware of, over lawyering it or, or pushing back too hard on sort of uh, crazy things or maybe like, uh, you know, sticking on one thing when really it's like a 1% chance of happening. And so it's not worth holding up the whole deal over. But 
you know, realize that you have value and that your product has value that you're making. And, you know, just don't, don't accept a bad deal just because you're afraid to ask for anything, right? Very rarely will they come back and say, I can't believe you changed it. I think one time I had a company where they were like, <laughs> you would think I, I, I don't know, I, I insulted their mothers or something like that, right? I mean, the way they came back, they were like, I can't believe you made these changes. You know, we, we, I thought we had a deal and I thought that... I said, you're crazy. This is totally normal business stuff to push back on, on these onerous clauses that you have in your, in your contract. So don't be afraid. Have some confidence. What are some of those onerous clauses? What are some things you mentioned earlier of making sure there's a way to get the game rights back, making sure there's some minimums in there that a, a company can't just have the thing in, you know, for in, infinity. <laughs> uh, but what are some of the other things that designers need to just be on the lookout for, just be aware of, make sure that their contracts have, have these things or or things that they want to avoid? Uh, a couple things. All right. Number one, yeah, the big one is being able to get out of it if things are not going well, right? If the publisher is not holding up their end of the bargain, you need to be, have a way to get out, right? And then maybe some certain minimum standards of things that they're doing that basically they're earning the right to continue publishing this game. That's number one. Number two is the scope of the rights that you're giving them. So maybe you are you just have one game, you're giving them that. They probably have a right of first refusal to publish like add-ons and expansions and sequels. That's nice. Sometimes they want a last match so that if they refuse it in the beginning, you can then go and you know find another company to potentially publish it. And then they want to be able to match that offer, right? And if you don't like working with them, then you don't necessarily want them to have that right. Uh, a lot of companies will want like TV rights and movie rights and all this crazy stuff. And you look at their history and they've never done a TV show and they've never done movies. They, you know, I, Why am I giving you these rights to make a, a TV series out of my game when you've never done it before? It doesn't make any sense. So we'll push back on that a lot. Um, the royalty provisions are another one where, you know, sometimes they, you know, they receive the money and then they have like 30 days to send you a report and then you need to send them an invoice and then they have like 60 days to pay the invoice. And they just have these like extremely long timelines for paying you the money that you're owed. And, you know, sometimes there's no requirement that they send a statement that shows like the number of units they sold and the, the price of the units and the territory they sold it in. So it's just like a, a black box. Like you don't they're just sending you a royalty check and you have no idea how many they sold or, or what they you know, where they sold them. Uh, another one is approvals. So a lot of times you need to submit materials for them to approve. Uh, and they will basically get like 30 days to approve it. And then if they don't approve it in that 30 days, it's deemed to be disapproved. So then you're just like left after a month, <laughs> you know, wondering, well, is it wrong? Do you, you know, do I need to change something? And there's really no uh, requirement on their end that they actually communicate that. So you want to make sure that, you know, there's a, a time limit that maybe if they don't, respond in that time, then it's automatically approved or something like that. Something to sort of light a fire under them and get them to approve your stuff. Because a lot of times, especially in the video game context, you know, you're waiting on approvals to continue creating things. And if they have like a month to approve things, then that's a month that could potentially be wasted, you know, where you could have been working on the approved thing. So, you know, we try to shrink that time period down as much as possible and try to try to get some sort of uh, penalties for them not approving things on time. So those are some of the big things. You know, there's other things like making sure that they promise they're going to follow the law when they publish your game and they're not going to, you know, incorporate infringing intellectual property into the game and, you know, promising to defend you in case you get sued because of something they did. Uh, a lot of times those clauses are really one-sided. So just sort of turning those things, it's called indemnification and warranties and representations, making them, uh, mutual uh, and having some some sort of promises on their end is another good one. Gotcha. There's a, there's a that, good two thirds awesome. of the agreement that probably makes no sense to most people. That is where a lot of these like sort of you know devil in the details kind of things happen, and a lot of one sided stuff is going to be. So uh, there, a lot of times they allow themselves to assign their rights to another company without your consent, and so that means you could you know you give your game to one publisher. And then they have the right to go and send it to another publisher, or maybe they like create a new brand under it and that brand's never released anything. And, you know, you don't know who they are. Uh, and then they assign it over to them. And now you're working with a whole new team and they're not approving what you thought they had approved before. I mean, it could be a huge mess. So you maybe want to get some, uh, 
some right over consent uh, of, of those assignments, things like that. So lots of, I mean, there's a million things you could change in a contract, uh, but those are some of the highlights I think that I usually deal with. Exactly. This has been awesome, man. So many things to be aware of, so many things just to think about and to research and talk to a professional about. And so thank you so much for just sharing. You can learn all this stuff on your own, but it seems a, a little more cost effective to just uh, work with someone like me to, to help you out since I've already done the, uh, <laughs> the learning. Yeah, exactly. Where can people find you online if they want to hire you or, or send you a contract they're working on? Uh, where can people check you out? Easiest way is uh, gamelawyerblog.com. That'll take you right to my blog, but there's, you know, a price list, there's a contact form, there's all that stuff. Uh, you can set up a consultation, all that right on the website. So gamelawyerblog.com will take you right there. I don't tweet, I don't do any of that stuff. So the website is the place to be to, to contact me. Awesome. Zach, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining me on the show. My pleasure. All right. Thank you.